Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to speak on access control in Kubernetes, specifically what's missing and how to fix it. So first off, a caveat, because access control is a security topic, and security is extremely important. This is not a talk about how Lyft runs systems. It's not a talk about how Triller runs systems. These are our personal opinions as operators, largely working with small companies and small clusters. And we are generalists with Kubernetes. We're not security experts. We may be wrong. So with that said, in Kubernetes, users interact with a virtual object model. So some of these objects are very logically corresponding, like pods are a thing. Sometimes it's a lot more virtual, like a replica set or a priority class. We use something that's analogous to REST CRUD with the Kubernetes API to interact with these objects. And like any system, we need a way to gate this access so that we don't make every single thing interacting with the cluster run as effectively root. All right, so before we dive in um, and list off a bunch of tools, uh, things like that, it helps to think about uh, the fundamentals. There's three broad um, categories of access control in Kubernetes. We have, first up, the uh, runtime characteristics. So do your pods have access to the disk under the hood? Uh, what do resource limits look like, privileges, things like that? Next up, we have the network side of things. So how do these things talk to each other? What can communicate with what? And things like that. Lastly is the kind of meta aspect, which is what has access to our control plane and our data uh, plane? And that's important because that's control of Kubernetes itself. And with access to those things, you can probably modify the first two. All right, so there's a bunch of different approaches and tools and like Valerie said, we're not experts, but we're going to focus on a small but useful subset of them. Uh, the first one being RBAC, role-based access control. A lot of people should be familiar with that. Um, and namespaces that go along with it, you can use to limit your scope of your RBAC, um, things like that. Uh, network policies, again, helps with communication. What can talk to what? Uh, things like that. Custom Kubernetes API gateways are the next thing putting something in front of the Kubernetes API and limiting what has been exposed. Uh, next, admission webhooks, validating and mutating. Uh, is it allowed in the cluster? And do we need to change it before it's created in the cluster? And lastly, the open policy agent, which is an external tool and can be used to simplify uh, webhooks and other policy management. And note that this, since we're talking about a subset of security, there's many security tools beyond this. We're specifically focusing on access control in this talk. So let's start by looking at the built-in authorization system, RBAC. RBAC's been around for a long time. It went GA in about 1.8. Hopefully, people who are using Kubernetes in production are familiar by now. But as a recap, RBAC provides roles which have several components. There's two kinds, role or cluster role. Role applies specifically to namespace level resources. Cluster role applies to things that don't fit within a namespace, like a namespace itself. We specify an API group and resources, which refers to what kind of thing the policy applies to, say, pods in the core API group. Then we specify whatever CRUD style verbs we want to allow this profile to be able to perform. So next up is the role binding. The role binding associates a user and a role. So there's, similar to um, roles, there's a role binding and a cluster role binding. And again, that's at the per namespace level or at the entire cluster scope. We give it some users and service accounts we want it to apply to, and then we give it the roles or cluster roles we're linking to. And you can kind of mix and match a lot of these, so it's not necessarily one role to one user. So this chain of things can be easiest to visualize. I find it's very easy to get things wrong because you have a very wide chain of, of connected resources between the thing that you're running and the actual permissions that you've assigned. So these are all fairly pluggable things. Lately, I've been playing around with ways to aggregate resource viewing in Kubernetes because there's often a concept of chains where one thing will create or own or link with another. So this is the kind of view that I think is very helpful to come up with, especially when you're debugging, because there's many ways that you can typo or forget something where you don't necessarily have the permissions that you expect. 
So aside from RBAC, there's a few other forms of object access control. So there is no base access control, which is what kubelets use internally. Essentially, it's a list of what a kubelet needs to run inherently and kind of the sum of permissions that are necessary for the workloads on it. So the idea is that kubelets can't actually access everything. They can only do what's relevant for the pods actively on them as a way to help prevent escalation through arbitrary kubelets. There's ABAC, which is the deprecated predecessor to, predecessor to RBAC. It basically jammed um, permissions directly onto users without really a concept of being able to reuse those profiles. And then there's webhook auth, which completely outsources the decision outside of the cluster. So you give it a URL, it posts to that external system, and then uses the response to decide whether or not to allow the authorization. So RBAC's main limitation is its lack of granularity. For example, RBAC grants permission by kind of resource, but doesn't allow you to discriminate on that within a namespace. So say if you grant permission to modify pods within a namespace, there's no way to say, but only the Redis pods, it's all of them. And so similarly, you also can't narrow scope within fields. So I can't say you can only edit labels or you can only edit replicas. If you can edit something, you can edit all the fields and all its properties. So let's look at namespaces, which are the companion to RBAC as far as scoping things. Namespaces are somewhat analogous to containers in that they are a way to segment the control plane and share the data plane in a logical fashion. So they're introduced as a way to run like different apps, different systems on one cluster without worrying about the cost and pain that comes with running many actual clusters. Most resources fit in the per namespace level. Some resources are cluster wide. And this is very important. Namespaces are a resource boundary. They're not a security boundary. So there's no, not necessarily any segmentation of resources. So if someone gets onto a host, doesn't really matter what namespace what's in. So namespaces let us scope our back. This means we can just wrap everything in lots of tiny, tiny namespaces and give it exactly the permissions we want, right? Not quite. So if we get very granular with namespaces, we start to want to cross these namespaces. And that gets tricky. This is an eternal problem when it comes to any kind of resource control and computing. We want to encapsulate stuff, wrap it up, and then suddenly there is some kind of scope creep between things, and it gets messy. So first off, we have many clear chains of resources in Kubernetes, like a deployment owns replica sets, owns pods, or ingress has services which map to pods. So at the very least, we need to keep these together. And we're probably going to want to wrap stuff even bigger than that. So that means we have to have a pretty wide scope with our back, even though we technically have the ability to constrain it. So what else can we do? All right, so we're going to look at a few ways to supplement access within namespaces, um, and what we can do to control things within that namespace, starting with the most manual approach, which is creating a custom API gateway or a deputy that sits in front of your Kubernetes API. So what if we don't want to expose direct access to these resources? You can do the same thing you do in other forms of software. Create a gateway in front of the resource. Uh, put an API in front of the Kubernetes API and only expose certain things to downstream systems, either other systems or uh, users. The majority of the time, this is not something you're going to want to do because you're solving a problem in a complicated way, probably something that could be solved by just a few lines of config in some other tools. Uh, so in this example, what we've done, we've got our Kubernetes API and a deployment, and we've put a gateway API in front. And all we're exposing is, uh, let's say we let the users change the replica count on this deployment, and that's it. So this is nice because consumers of this API only have to understand the replicas for that deployment, nothing else. Um, they understand the simple API rather than the full deployment object, uh, which I don't know about everybody here, but was really confusing when I first saw it. Um, and additional logic can be built in, maybe allowing control for the rate of change, that you can't scale this up or scale it down too fast, and you can get as complex as you want. So this is neat, but it has some obvious drawbacks. It's another moving part in a system with a lot of moving parts, and it's a code burden in your system and fills a very niche role, at least uh, in this case. Uh, but luckily, there's other ways to do this kind of logical gating in a more Kubernetes-native way. 
So next up, admission webhooks. So bringing request gating to the API itself and hopefully eliminating your need to run a custom service. So admission webhooks run after authentication and authorization and before admission, hence the name. Um, two kinds, validating and mutating. Validating is, does the object I want to create comply with some sort of policy? A replica count, uh, does it come from a trusted image repository? Do I have resource limits set, privileges, things like that. Second is the mutating webhook. I'm gonna let you create this object in my cluster, but I'm gonna change it in some way. You'll see this a lot with sidecar injection, with a lot of service meshes out there. You go to create a deployment and it just dynamically injects that sidecar if it doesn't uh, already exist, uh, things like that. So both of these can ensure valid um, things are launched into your cluster and obviously you can use them together. All right, so. You can do a lot of things manually with admission webhooks, um, but another way, if you're looking to kind of standardize your policy management, you can use the open policy agent. I am by no means an expert in OPA. There's an intro session after this. There's a deep dive tomorrow. Go to those if you really want to dive in or talk to the Stira folks in the vendors uh, area. But um, we want to have policies on things created in our cluster. What's the simpler way to do this? Uh, the uh, open policy agent is, uh, I think one of their taglines is a lightweight policy engine. What does that mean? It takes the decisions uh, for allow, deny, things like that, the policy, out of your service. So when you go to create something, make a change, things like that, OPA knows what's running in your cluster, has some policies you've created, um, and we'll check against those and say, hey, is this allowed? Could be something like, I'm trying to pull a public image from Docker Hub, but I only am allowed to pull internal images from my company's repository. So that would be a deny and then would not be allowed. Um, so you can do this you know, context specific, dynamic, the image you, uh, you've used, what ports are open, what protocols are they serving, are they running privileged, things like that. And this can work together so you don't have to really spec out these combinations, OPA can aggregate it for you. So you can use Open Policy Agent and uh, a controller. I know Gatekeeper is really popular. I think that one's still in alpha. There's a tutorial on OPA's website, though. Um, but does your object meet my defined criteria, uh, whatever that object is? Is it a service with an incorrect load balancer name? Uh, things like that. Uh, and then can return to you why you're not allowed to take that action instead of just giving you some obscure error that your YAML's incorrect or something like that, um, which is always more useful than just getting an, uh, an explicit, sorry, can't do this. Um, another nice thing is it can be leveraged to return a patch uh, in the form of JSON that tells you what you need to apply to your object. Hey, you didn't do this thing, come back when you have resource limits. You're using, you know, you're gonna use all the CPU on this node. Um, you could even leverage this in a, neither, in a dynamic way and create a mutating webhook and actually patch it for your users manually. Maybe just give them some sort of base resource limit that they need to require when they just try to create something into the cluster without anything specific. Um, so this allows you to have this kind of separation of duties and enhance the coverage and security so you don't end up with, you know, let's say a bunch of um, little itty bitty security holes that in the aggregate can be a bigger issue. Um, and again, I mentioned Gatekeeper. Please check that one out. That one's um, a great way to get started. Um, so lastly, I've not seen anyone do this publicly yet, but I've heard about it, is using the open policy agent to leverage network policies, again, controlling that what can talk to what. Um, and a lot of these happen at you know, layer four. This can't talk to that. But what if we could be dynamic and do that at uh, layer seven? Can I post to widgets, but get, uh, can I not post to widgets, and but I can get widgets based on some sort of labels or annotations or something on my pods? Um, and then you can combine network policy, admission controllers, and the open policy agent and say, I'm going to read labels and annotations on these pods and adjust the network policy accordingly leveraging admission controllers to ensure that those labels and annotations exist. Because if the tool's looking for some sort of label and it doesn't exist, you're out of luck. It's not gonna manage or control anything for you. So OPA lets us narrowly restrict at a logical level beyond just what RBAC does. So 
Seth mentioned network policies. Network policies are another key part of the access puzzle. Kubernetes by default has a flat network. And this is one of those things that I was shocked when I learned it. So every single pod by default can talk to every single other pod. This includes pods without services, and this includes cross namespaces. If there's a port open on a container, it can be accessed, and that's pretty scary. An attacker can use that to traverse your network or escalate or do anything nasty. And on top of that, potentially having that wide network behind the perimeter means that you can start building up some accidental service dependencies that perhaps aren't properly known and dealt with. So that can be a big surprise one day. So with any service, we have a defined set of calls that the service can make within one another. So you can get this if your service is small and simple enough from just putting it on a napkin. You might use a service mesh. But either way, you can create a graph of what calls what. What we'd like to be able to do is specifically segment everything such that only the things that are supposed to call one another actually can access one another to prevent some nasty surprises. So this is often easy to think about service to service, but we can potentially get very granular. The easiest way to do this is with the Kubernetes network policy. So the network policy is a native object, although somewhat perplexingly, there's no native controller for it. So if you just take an off-the-shelf cluster, apply some network policy YAML, nothing will happen. You need a third-party controller such as Calico. So the policy uses selectors like namespaces and pod selectors to apply to pods. When it applies to them, those just have no networking allowed unless you put overrides in. The overrides let you do things like, say, service A is only allowed to talk to service B, or service B is only allowed to talk to the outside world to restrict that network graph. So here we have a simple example of that service A to service B type YAML. We use a selector for ingress, and we use a selector for egress between two different services. And I mean service in the lowercase s sense. So there's surprisingly few add-ons, in my opinion, that support this right now. Um, Calico is one of the main ones that people talk about as far as executing on network policies. There's also a lot of tools, things in like the service meshy space that don't necessarily work with network policy, but offer similar functionality. For example, Istio has ways to restrict inter-service traffic. So some of the issues we've identified come from core functionality that doesn't exist. For example, the flat open network where there's no controller. Some of it is just ways where namespaces in the RBAC are too wide and can be tough to manage. So we see kind of two ways that someone, when they're architecting out their cluster, can address this problem. One is getting very granular within namespaces and having sub-namespace permissioning. The other is having lots of tiny namespaces and leaning more on RBAC. So let's kind of examine some ideas in both of those spaces. First thing is we had a kind of theoretical approach to having sub-namespace granularity based on object-level permission. So instead of relying on tiny namespaces, you could grant permissions on singular objects, however is necessary, and therefore have essentially whatever access control you want without re-architecting the cluster. So this inspiration comes from in Unix, where everything is a file, somewhat similar to in Kubernetes, where everything is an object that has some YAML that represents it. So in Unix, everything has the permission octal. It's a set of digits that correspond to, for different groups, who can do what and what those set of permissions are, so such as like the owner can read, write, execute. This can be messy, but it's also very powerful. So since everything in Kubernetes is a structured object, we have our API version kind, metadata, spec, status. Metadata is kind of the easiest thing to fuzz around if we want to insert something with a custom controller. We could also potentially abuse annotations. It's very common to essentially stringify some JSON and just put that entirely in an annotation. So that can be a good way if you're not modifying the Kubernetes core itself. So hypothetically, we can put something in this metadata around granting ownership on that object rather than trying to apply things namespace-wide. 
So this could be done fairly simply by giving like full owners, or we could get very, very granular, like saying certain fields that these can edit and access. However, the more we thought about it, the more we figured out that this was not necessarily a good idea. So I don't know about many of you, I've administered some pretty large and messy VMs in my time, and the more custom and bespoke individual objects in a system get, the harder and more unclear they are to manage. And lack of clarity and difficulty is a security flaw because you're more likely to get things wrong. So this isn't a good idea. Instead, we should lean on something like admission webhooks or OPA if we want to have particular restrictions on something very fine-tuned and then fall back to RBAC for kind of our coarse-grained security permissions. Uh, or we could go in the opposite direction and keep per namespace RBAC and have more smaller namespaces. Um, think of it like the genie in Aladdin, phenomenal cosmic power, itty bitty living space, phenomenal cluster power, itty bitty namespace. Um, so as it stands, objects that rely on one another need to be housed in the same namespace. Ingresses target a service that then targets pods or endpoints. Deployments control replica sets that go down to pods. Um, so uh, this leads to the issue where namespace level service accounts can't be used in multiple namespaces. So if you have uh, bots or service accounts, things like that, you're going to need to create them in every single namespace where they're required. Or consider making them cluster level. For example, in many cases, you'd want a cluster level controller for a resource. Um, so to keep namespaces small, we need to accept cross namespace functionality. Um, trying to get rid of it leads to more complexity than it's worth. Uh, so you can restrict access between namespaces and only allow explicitly permitted services to cross those namespaces. Uh, and you could even try and restrict things further um, within that namespace. So when you end up with controllers or external systems that need to target things in multiple namespaces, uh, you can either consider duplicating that component, uh, such as de uh, per deploy credentials and namespaces, um, or as Valerie mentioned, operating it at uh, cluster level, such as like a cluster-wide controller on your Redis instances or things like that. Um, so in case uh, you were all distracted on Twitter, what do you need to take away from this? Firstly, Kubernetes design priority is deliberately extensibility over out-of-the-box usability. So this is why we're all here. This is why KubeCon is so big, because we can make it work for us. But the problem is we do need to make it work for us. It is not something that we necessarily just install and go. So security is one of those many considerations where it may work. It will probably not work well without some fine tuning. So you can group resources together where it makes sense. Uh, you can do namespaces for your front end bits, namespace for the back end, and namespace for your data related things. Um, there can be some sort of best practices around this, something along those lines, but it's probably going to look different for everybody uh, based on your individual use cases. Uh, we can't tell you the best way to chop up the namespaces in your cluster. Um, I could try, but I don't know your environment, and I'd probably be wrong. So when you have namespaces that are as small as is reasonable to make them, use RBAC to make access as reasonably tight as you need it. This is something where you may make compromises based on just what is going to rabbit hole in security for your business and your priorities, as well as leaning on those other technologies that we mentioned rather than trying to do everything in pure RBAC. So using tooling like admission webhooks, uh, you can start with just validating webhooks, just a pure allow or deny on something, uh, and you know, don't allow the objects in your cluster that don't meet your requirements. Uh, improper environment variables, uh, privileges I don't like, not going to happen. Um, you can move on to mutating hooks to change the things that you're launching in your cluster and maybe bring them into line just a little bit if they're only you know, a step out of line. Uh, you can use tools from the community like Open Policy Agent to standardize the policy for things like this uh, and you know, bring some uniform management to your policy for things in and out of cluster. So we didn't introduce ourselves at the beginning. I'm Valerie. I recently joined at Lyft. I have been in the Kubernetes community for a while, and I do a little bit of everything. These days I'm trying to focus on SIG network, but I do all kinds of stuff upstream and downstream right now. <laughs> 
Uh, and I'm Seth, I work at Triller. Uh, I came from an IT operations background, so I was not a software engineer when I started doing these things. Uh, and when I'm not f uh, messing with Kubernetes, uh, I like to play guitar and collect fountain pens. And thanks for coming. All right, we're ready to take questions. We're also willing to take questions while the music plays in the background, because it was this really cool like James Bond intro theme thing going on, so if you guys are more into that, we can bring that back too. Thank you. Whoever picked it up, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for the useful information. Uh, we actually stumbled upon a lot of uh, all of these trying to build a multi user solution for Kubeflow. And one of the problems we're having is we're having a multi user scenario where each user has a separate namespace, which I think is pretty common, right? And the thing is, we had the problem with the scenario where we want each user to be able to delete his own namespace, but this doesn't make sense in our bug. Uh, I mean, have you encountered this? Do, may, do you maybe have a workaround? Have you thought about this? I've never encountered anything like that. Just to clarify, did you mention that every user has their own namespace? Exactly. Oh, yeah. I've never configured anything like that. That would be an interesting problem to solve. Uh, for me, I've always just configured, you know, grouping like projects and things together. Valerie, do you have any thoughts? Um, I'm trying to remember if you can nicely segment that or not. You could definitely pull something off with OPA, but I'm not sure if vanilla RBAC would be able to assign permission of a cluster level resource like that. You'd have to do something with if your user ends up deleting their namespace, how do they get it back? You don't want to give them, you know, permissions to create a bunch of namespaces cluster wide. So that's an interesting problem. So yeah, OPA couldn't quite do it because you don't know which user is requesting that. You're only on the admission path. You don't know which user is uh, issuing that request, right? So I was looking a bit into admission webhook. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, I mean authorization webhooks. Mm -hmm. There is that option too to plug into your own authorization, but it seems that they don't want to make it dynamic upstream. That's the feeling I got. Have you looked into this a little bit dynamic webhook authorization? I have not too much. Thanks a lot. Anybody from Stira here that works on OPA? We can make that happen, huh? Yeah. What's that? Just throw the mic. Just bad idea. Yeah, so, so on APA, OPA, when you get the request, uh, you have a user info on the request. So assuming, so you have the identity. You can use the identity in OPA. Yeah, but you have to have like another sidecar container that extracts the identities from LDAP or whatever is your identity provider, because you only have the object ID. So you have to have to, to inject in OPA other information, but it, it's there. Uh, can I also have a question? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you've already got the mic. I'm gonna take it away. <laughs> uh, so one issue that we are having is that we we went with the route to use OPA with. Uh, being more granular than our back at the namespace level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we allow, we create, for example, some default network policies, but we also like to allow the user to uh, create or delete network policies from himself. himself. Mm -hmm. And the issue is that we'd like to, to somehow make the default resources that were created immutable, so they don't delete the default network policies and stuff like that. So I'm wondering if anyone will, you can recommend a way to do that. Can we make resources immutable, not to delete them or something? I don't believe so. I'm looking at Valerie. To fill in the blanks. No, no. No, if Kubernetes allows you to have like immutable resources or something like that. Not really. You'd have to create a custom gate in front of that where the gateway can edit it, but the end user can. Okay, so with OPA, thank you. Thank you. Get super meta and control OPA with OPA. Yeah, you might need a custom gateway for that, where the gateway has edit access, but that's not exposed to the user. Turtles all the way down. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thanks for um, coming, everyone.
I had Any one question, questions? but... Oh, cool. Yeah, All right, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you didn't stand uh, up. I didn't see you. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Any thoughts about uh, Istio RBAC and uh, Open Policy Agent working together? Uh, have you tried that? Uh, how to uh, maybe enable Open Policy Agent in uh, Mixer in Istio? Or, or? So I know there's some sections of the Istio documentation. I was in Gareth's uh, unit testing Kubernetes with OPA before this. I haven't dove a lot into using... Uh, OPA and Istio together, but I do know it is one project that is uh, bringing it in and is going to support it natively so you don't have to be super hacky with it. Okay, thanks. Okay, I have a question because uh, you also mentioned that. Uh, Dividing to multiple nine space uh, to get uh, more control. Uh, also, for your experience, what is, uh, based on your experience, uh, the approach uh, better that one big cluster for multi tenant user, or do you have some limits when, I don't know, you reach like 20 nine space and you create a separate clusters? And also, did you experiment with cross cluster connections? I think. So, um I'm sure there's some kind of point at which etcd would fall over with too many namespaces, but certainly wouldn't be 20. Um, rule of thumb is more likely when you get to too big of a cluster size in terms of nodes or workload, you'd look at splitting up. Um, personally, I advise against splitting workloads between clusters unnecessarily unless they either have very different SLAs, require very different clusters themselves, or have like entirely different security classes like payment processing versus a website. I tend to limit my number of namespaces to the max of when it gets difficult to remember what goes in each different namespace, which is different for every company, but that's when you automate. We have many, many namespaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Triller's not Lyft. Apologies. Cheers. Thanks. Um, just one on the na number of namespaces. Yeah. It's from a different story, but OpenShift support limit is on the order of 10,000, I think. Um, the question I wanted to ask was about, um, so you looked at uh, supplementing objects, resource definitions with, uh, as I, I think you put it well, abusing annotations, uh, but have you looked at extending the role and the role binding objects? Would that be like something like a label selector? Potentially, the concern is it's way easier to make it too hard and easy to kind of foot gun yourself versus useful, but that's definitely another approach that could be done because that's also a bit more unified because in Kubernetes, individual objects are a bit more mass produced and less bespoke compared to like the traditional model of a Unix file. I think we have maybe time for one more. I think we're going to get kicked out soon. I think I see people walking in. So one more. And then I'm going to hang out out there after this if anybody else wants to talk about more stuff. Thank you. Um, so um, we are running the following constellation. We have uh, an Apache server in front of uh, the Kubernetes cluster and a firewall between them. Um, we are setting a lot of rules on the Apache server, uh, like allow methods and directory-based rules. Um, how do I avoid over managing configurations on the Apache and then with the network policies, with the pod policies, what methods can I access um, and so on. Because I'm just, I just fear if I do it all over the place, I'm going to lose control some, sometime. Part of that might be a manner of preference for your system. Personally, I would break it up to application level logic goes into Apache and then more lower level network logic like pure allow deny for any traffic should be at the cluster level. Cool. Thanks for coming, everyone.